hey, it's Dr. D'Amico here. Uh, what I'm going to do in today's video, instead of coming to class, having class face to face, uh, just going to record this video and I'm going to go over some of the concepts that we've sort of started already talking about, maybe you've started reading about, um, and that'll sort of help us set ourselves up for really the rest of the semester. Um, so two of the $5 words, as my Mima used to say, well, my Mima used to call them 25 cent words, but accounting for inflation, I call them $5 words, paradox and ideology. Um, and it's, it's my belief that thinking about these two words can help us understand a lot about American identity and about some of the controversies really we're seeing today in the United States that do relate to how we think about history and the relationship of the past to the present. Yes, we still are in the colonial era. So um, we're kind of to this part now, English colonization in the 1600s. And maybe, yeah, maybe this week, maybe next week, we're going to get into the 1700s. So just to sort of remind you about the 1600s, you've seen this map before. And this is just to remind you that the English started colonizing North America in the 1600s. They were a little bit late to that party, right? So here's North America, except in this, in this imaginary map of North America, imaginary version, um, there are no Native Americans, right? This land's just empty, just waiting for Europeans to come colonize it, which is, of course, not true. But it's nevertheless a helpful map to help us conceive of and remember that a big part of what was happening in North America in the 1600s were Spanish efforts to colonize coming north from Mexico and French efforts to colonize coming down the St. Lawrence River from Canada. I, I love how there's no Canada on this map and no Mexico, just the United States. Like, okay, okay, interesting choice. But anyway, the French are coming down from Canada, the St. Lawrence River into the Great Lakes region, down the Mississippi River. Um, and then the English are coming from England right first to the chesapeake virginia maryland other uh, then a little further south are other southern colonies and then north to new england so okay that's this map the first permanent successful quote unquote i mean what it were they that successful no 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 but the first permanent English settlements in North America were first Jamestown, and that's Virginia, in 1607, and then Plymouth, and that is going to become Massachusetts in 1620. So um, here's Jamestown, here's Plymouth. So what we've been thinking about and <laughs> actually what a lot of Americans are thinking about right now um, has been the history of labor systems generally and of course what we've been talking a lot about is slavery um, so a couple things when we're talking about the history of slavery um, as you know this stuff is difficult. It's stuff that Americans are grappling with right now, Americans of all races. Um, and a couple of things I just want you to remember about when we talk about this. Um, one thing I want you to remember is the concept of agency. Oh, yeah, I have a slide. Agency. One of my professors in grad school was really famous for saying 
that history is people making choices and those choices making a difference. And I think that's a great way to think about history. It's also a great way to think about this concept of agency. Agency is just the word historians use to remind ourselves that people have been agents in history. People make choices. Those choices make a difference. And I think, um, I think maybe part of the reason that when people study history, they think it's really boring is um, I actually don't think their teachers are doing it right. <laughs> Uh, I am throwing shade, I guess, on <laughs> some history teachers. Because a lot of the times I think you could study history and think that the only people who have agency, it's, it's not even just, it's not white men, actually, because it's not even all white men when you study history. A lot of the times it's like five or ten people who mostly do happen to be, but you know, white men. But what I'm saying is history is much more than that. And that's also what Howard Zinn thinks, by the way, right? So see how this dog is very bored. I think that oftentimes we're bored when we study history, maybe because we can't see ourselves in it. So, um, but, there's all kinds of ways in which different people, people who you may never have heard of um, in the past did, did make choices and those choices did make a difference. Uh, so just something to think about. And of course, I just wanna emphasize too, that there's a lot of things people have no control over when it comes to studying the past or the present. A great example is a pandemic, right? We, uh, germs spread. Um, we have some control over that, but not nearly as much as we would like. Another might be natural disasters in history or weather in history. Okay, if you want to hear more about that, take my environmental history course. It's super interesting. But I'm just saying, this kind of is the study of history, is this interplay between people being able to make choices that make a difference, and then all those things that um, limit people's ability to make choices that make a difference. So. Um, what I'm going to do now is just tell you some examples of agency in history. This is Pocahontas' father, but during his lifetime, he was not famous for being Pocahontas' father. Pocahontas was kind of famous for being his daughter. And Powhatan definitely thought he had the power in the relationship between himself and the English in the early 1600s in Virginia. And he did really have a lot of the power. It's just when we look back, we tend to forget that because we know everything that happened after that. Um, but he was the leader of this incredibly powerful confederacy of Native Americans. And what he thought he was doing was bringing the English into his confederacy. Here's another person I thought I'd tell you about. Uh, Elianga, Gaspar Elianga. Um, so this is down in Mexico, and it's it's in the early 1600s, so right about the time period we've been talking about, except down in Mexico. And Elianga um, was the leader of a maroon colony of slaves. What does that mean? Maybe oh, oh heck, what does that mean? Maybe you're asking yourselves. So maroon, maroons or marrones in Spanish, these were descendants of Africans in the Americas who uh, ran away from slavery and started their own settlements. This, these were all over. Uh, actually, the Florida Seminoles, so maybe you know of the Seminole tribe because of um, the college sports team called the Florida Seminoles. The Seminoles are descended from African American and Native American people. Um, who founded these types of colonies, maroon or marron colonies in Florida. So this is in Mexico. Uh, Alianga successfully resisted a Spanish attack on the colony that he helped to found. I'm going to move his picture so you don't see those words. Okay, anyway, and then in 1618, he, he his colony was so successful that they actually um, like it says here, they achieved a, an agreement. They signed an agreement with the Mexican government 
for self-rule of the settlement they founded. Um, in the late 1800s, he was named a national hero of Mexico, El Primer Libertador de las Americas, the first liberator of the Americas. And it's uh, the settlement he founded has now been renamed in his honor. You can look him up on Wikipedia if you're interested. So just an example of agency on the part of people who I think if you read a lot of American history textbooks, you wouldn't see that many um, enslaved African Americans actually doing very much, but they did. They did. So, okay. That brings me right to the paradox of American history. So I've shown you this before. I've shown you Edmund Morgan before. He wrote American Slavery, American Freedom. And a lot of what Howard Zinn says in chapter three actually comes from this book. Um, so I'm just going to remind you about the word paradox. Um, okay, so paradox. I'm typing paradox definition into Google. So I typed paradox definition into Google, and here's what I found. Um, first of all, I found 131 million results. Wow, okay. That's a lot. That's overwhelming. But it's okay, because really all I'm looking for is the definition, and at the top it says, a seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement or proposition that when investigated or explained may prove to be well-founded or true. So it's when two things that seem like they both shouldn't be true at the same time are true at the same time. What better example of that is there than slavery and freedom in American history? And so that's what Edmund Morgan's book is about. I've mentioned this to you before. And this is kind of the, the last point on this slide is what I get sort of excited to think about. What if studying where racism, racism came from, like where and how did racism come from? What if studying that might help us um, reconsider the mindset that allowed racism to come into being? And what if that might help us sort of think of new ways to think about the world without racism? To me, that's 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 why I'm interested in studying history is the, to uncover our assumptions we make about the world around us and maybe in uncovering them to come up with new mindsets. So <clears throat> are slavery and freedom a paradox in American history? Edmund Morgan set out to answer that question in the early 1970s. And he wrote that racism became an essential, if unacknowledged, ingredient of the Republican ideology. It's little r Republican, by the way. It's We're not talking about the Republican Party. We're talking about um, the idea of having a republic, which the United States is a republic and has been a republic since the American Revolution. So racism, according to Morgan, became an essential, if unacknowledged, ingredient of the Republican ideology that enabled Virginians to lead the nation. Whoa. What the heck does that mean? Well, Edmund Morgan pointed out that four out of the first five presidents of the United States of America were Virginians. Uh, my little joke there is that they were not virgins. They were Virginians. Ha ha ha. I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry, really. Okay, so Virginians wrote the Declaration of Independence and much of the Constitution. So, and I'm mostly thinking of like Thomas Jefferson wrote a lot of the Declaration. 
I'm thinking of James Madison wrote a lot of the Constitution there. But so this is this is you probably know this. This is the preamble, the sort of beginning of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Self-evident, so obvious that they're just self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. So just by the fact of being born human, all men, we'll talk about women later, right? But okay, all men are endowed by their creator. So this is like God given with certain unalienable rights. Unalienable means cannot be taken from you. You cannot give them away. You cannot sell them. Literally, no matter what you do or who you are, these rights endow to you. They're just part of you. And that among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Life, okay, we know what life is. Liberty, freedom, sort of, yeah. Pursuit of happiness, I mean, what does that mean? Interesting questions, but I'm just saying, look at this, TJ wrote this down. This is Thomas Jefferson, here's his statue here. He wrote this in 1776, long time ago. One of the most radical statements of human rights that have ever existed. But at the same time, this is the thing, is what? At the same time he wrote this, he himself was actively holding people in bondage. And in fact, this is one of his descendants through Sally Hemings, an enslaved woman. So yeah, that seems like a paradox, right? But what Edmund Morgan argues and what Zen says in chapter three is that maybe it's, what if it's not a paradox? What if, what if racism actually was an essential if unacknowledged ingredient in the ideology that Thomas Jefferson had when he wrote this? So, okay, hmm, what, um, what Edmund Morgan means by that is maybe, maybe the color line, which we talked about last week, was necessary for Thomas Jefferson to be able to conceive of this kind of idea. Maybe when he imagined it, he was imagining all men, and maybe he was really imagining not just actually white men, but um, probably white men who had a certain amount of money, who owned their own property. Is, is that what he was imagining? Maybe. And that's why we spend a lot of time on Bacon's Rebellion. So maybe what happened after that rebellion, which you remember was in 1675 to 76, and it's when the um, poor people of Jamestown sort of banded together. Um, there were some white people, some black people involved. They banded together they started by attacking Native Americans because they wanted that land, remember? They wanted that American dream. They wanted that ability to have their own little farms and get rich. The governor of Virginia, a guy named Berkeley, was like, hey, you can't do that. Stop it. And they were like, no. And so they, they burned down Jamestown. As you read about, this um, rebellion was put down. But maybe that's when the elite started getting pretty worried about 
the idea of an interracial uprising. And so I put this quote on this slide. This is Lyndon B. Johnson. So I don't know if you've heard of Lyndon B. Johnson, but he was president of the United States. Um, he became president after the assassination of JFK. So he was president of the United States in the 1960s. And he, uh, he was from Texas originally. And um, he was in Congress for a really long time before he became president. And he started his career, his professional political career, being an adamant segregationist. So a segregationist was somebody who was in favor of racial segregation. But as his career went on, and his time went on, he began to change his views. But then he became President Kennedy's running mate when, when JFK ran for office. And JFK had this civil rights platform that he wanted to get through. He was assassinated before he could get a lot of it through. But Lyndon Johnson started working to get some of the civil rights legislature through that Kennedy had been, um, had supported, you know, and he found it was really hard to do. And this is, this is, so Lyndon B. Johnson is sort of known for having these like quotes, you know, these very pithy little funny quotes that a lot of times say something really deep um, in a, an interesting way, usually with curse words, by the way. Um, and so here's how he put it in the 1960s. So you'll notice he uses the word colored to mean uh, African-American. And of course, we wouldn't use that term today. But I left it in there because I, I don't know, it's the original quote. I want you to see what he's saying. If you can convince the lowest white man he's better than the best colored man, he won't notice you're picking his pocket. Hell, give him somebody to look down on and he'll empty his pockets for you. So by um, convincing people that there is such a thing as race, first of all, that that even exists. Secondly, that if you're white, you're inherently better and better off than people of color. So no matter how poor you are, you still have somebody to look down on. Right. So instead of you maybe looking like doing what these people did during Bacon's Rebellion, instead of you looking at other poor people of all races and saying, hey, we have a lot in common. We could really kind of join together. Instead of that, you, a poor white man or woman, but OK, we'll just stick with men for a minute. You, a poor white man might be like hey i'm poor but it, like at least i've got this whiteness thing going for me i know that lyndon johnson would say that explains a lot about american history i think howard zen would agree i think edmund morgan would agree i think i agree so back to this slide but um I added a new fact to this slide here. 10 out of the first 12 presidents of the United States were slave owners. Hmm. What does that mean? It's interesting to consider, interesting to think about. So here's what Edmund Morgan says. And again, it's interesting because right now there's all these headlines about um, Oh, the 1619 project is a problem. It teaches people un-American ideas, maybe. Um, and I, 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 sure, the 1619 project, I could understand criticizing it for sure. I'm not saying it's perfect. But to me, what's really interesting is that this is, this is, this is stuff that Edmund Morgan wrote before I was born. Right? It was almost 50 years ago he wrote this. Um, so here's the question, really a big question. 
Was the vision of a nation of equals flawed at the source by contempt for both the poor and black? Is America still colonial Virginia writ large? What Edmund Morgan meant by the second part of that, the second question is um, colonial Virginia was not a democracy. It was really, there were people who could vote and things were decided by those voters, but it was nowhere even near half the population who could vote. You didn't just have to be a white man to vote in colonial Virginia. You had to be a rich white man. Is America still a nation where only the richest people are in charge? I mean, I don't know if that's for you to think about. But look at this first part of the question. Was the vision of a nation of equals flawed at the source by contempt, contempt for both the poor and black? So I see this conversation happening kind of all the time. People are um, noticing that somebody like Thomas Jefferson is, owned slaves with a lot of slaves, uh, had children with an enslaved woman, maybe consensually, maybe not, we don't know. And they're sort of like, like, does that mean we should cancel Thomas Jefferson? But if we cancel Thomas Jefferson, are we canceling the Declaration of Independence, like literally one of the founding documents of the United States? Can we do that? Do we want to do that? And oh, whoops, I don't really have the answers for you for that. Um, but I'm just noticing that's a conversation I'm having literally all the time with people. We can't just get rid of Thomas Jefferson, some people say. Others are like, maybe it's time to rethink Thomas Jefferson. Maybe it's time to, is it time to rethink the Declaration of Independence? I mean, I don't know. I'm going to go back to this slide to just show you that it does say all men are created equal. I mean, that's, that seems like a good idea. So uh, do we want to cancel that? I, I don't have the answers. I'm just noticing the question for you.